Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to the last week of our lectures on this NPTEL MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. Now this week will be devoted to looking at uh, some MATLAB uh, usage in, in case of portfolio optimization problem. Uh, so what I will do is that I will uh, focus mostly on the MATLAB uh, financial toolbox and we will use some ill built examples there. Uh, which will help you learn how to design your own portfolios and uh, for today's lecture we will talk about an example of uh, asset allocation problem. So what we start off with is that we consider uh, a, a specific example where you uh, uh, take into account several asset classes and then we look at the various uh, aspects of the problem beyond what we had done in case of uh, the mean variance uh, portfolio optimization techniques that we have learned uh, and we will go step by step uh, eventually leading us to uh, the weights of an optimized portfolio tailored to the requirements of an individual investors along with the investment strategy of buying and selling that is required in order to attain an optimized portfolio. So let us begin this lecture. Uh, by going into directly into the MATLAB's uh, help page on this particular topic. So we begin this lecture with uh, a case study on asset allocation using uh, MATLAB financial toolbox and uh, this is a fairly exhaustive example on how to set up a basic asset allocation. Uh, using the mean variance portfolio optimization. So, uh, this example is uh, covers many different perspective of asset allocation. Uh, firstly, in the paradigm of the mean variance portfolio optimization that we have already done uh, and in addition to that it brings about uh, more practical constraints that are applicable in a real life situation in order to determine your investment uh, in an optimal portfolio. So, this will involve several steps and I will uh, talk about uh, you know one step at a time. So, the first thing to do is to define uh, the portfolio problem. So, now uh, the goal is to manage an asset allocation fund. So, this means that you want to create a portfolio and the portfolio will not comprise just of individual stocks, but rather four asset classes. And uh, these four asset classes are bonds, so that is the risk free part or the risk free asset component uh, of the fund and there will be three components of equities namely large cap equities. Uh, this you can view this as uh, companies with large market capitalization, small cap equities that is smaller companies and emerging equities these are some of the uh, uh, smaller companies. Now, uh, once we have decided that uh, we are going to invest in these four asset classes, uh, the constraint is that the fund is going to be long only. So, that means you cannot take a short position as far as the equity component is concerned. Uh, so, that means your weights cannot be negative and uh, there can also be no borrowing or leverage. So, no borrowing is allowed or a using or usage of borrowed money is allowed. So, even in both in case of bond and the three classes of equities you are not allowed to have uh, any negative weight. Also the other constraint is that in order to ensure that the risk exposure is somewhat limited the other constraint is that uh, out of the total amount of money that you have at most 85 percent can be invested in the equity. So, that means the large cap equities and small cap equities and emerging equities the total amount of money that you invest in all of these three combined cannot be more than 85 percent of your initial investment and uh, amongst the equities where there is an upper cap of 85 percent you cannot put more than 35 percent of the total amount in emerging equities. 
So, now um, there is always a trading cost. So, we have not discussed the trading cost uh, in the regular class, but that is uh, a practical consideration that has to be uh, taken into account. So, the cost to trade in the first uh, three assets, namely the bond, the large and the small cap equities, all three is 10 basis points. So, 1 basis points, we must have heard a lot about basis points whenever there is an interest rate uh, change in the market. So, the 10 basis point here, so 1 basis point is 0 0.01 percent. So, 10 basis point is 0 0.1 percent. So, that is the transaction cost. Uh, and in case of the emerging equities, given the nature or extra risk, uh, riskiness that is associated with the emerging equities, uh, they will typically have a, a transaction cost that is 4 times higher. So, that is 40 basis points or uh, uh, 0 0.4 percent uh, 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 that can be allowed in terms of the transaction cost. Uh, also, finally, the constraint is that you have to ensure that the average turnover is no more than 15 percent. So, that means that eventually uh, you should not actually be at any time uh, liquidating uh, more than 15 percent of the assets. So, uh, now in order to solve this problem, you essentially have to first set up the basic mean variance portfolio optimization. Uh, problem and then you slowly introduce the constraints and what are the constraints? The first constraint was that you cannot have any negative weights. The next constraint was that 85 percent of the portfolios uh, can be in equities. So, at least 15 percent must be put in bonds and uh, at most 35 percent can be put in the emerging equities and the transaction costs are 10 basis points. Uh, for all the asset classes except emerging equities where it is uh, 40 basis point or 0 0.4 percent and finally, you want to incorporate the average turnover or that average turnover should not be more than 15 percent. Okay, uh, so, now, uh, now when I talk about asset class, obviously, in this context, I do not mean that you should be creating uh, different classes yourself, but instead for uh, instead of investing in uh, separate uh, equities or uh, stocks, uh, some of them in large cap, small cap and so on, you instead just invest in what are known as the exchange traded funds. Now, this simple example uh, sets forth that uh, the portfolio initial portfolio holdings that is the total amount invested in this four asset categories is going to be 7.5 million dollars and in addition you should have a cash position of 60000 dollars that is for uh, some exigencies and expenses that we will see uh, will appear later on so uh, so now that the initial uh, cost uh, that is involved is set up and uh, also you have you have uh, specified what are the uh, what are the constraints that are to be applicable. So, the first thing we do is that uh, we uh, set up this asset uh, the, the entire structure in terms of uh, the inputs. So, first of all we identify the assets and uh, the assets are identified here as bonds, large cap equities, small cap equities and emerging equities. Uh, and then uh, the next uh, row is the price. So, this gives the current price for each of these asset categories. So, this means that 52.4 uh, is the price of the bond, 122.7 uh, is the price of large cap equities, 35.2 uh, is the price for small cap equities and 46.9 is the price for emerging equities. Uh, now, the next thing that we talk about is the holding. So, the holdings are these are four numbers that is 42938, and so on. So, this holding indicates the number of units of each of those assets that you are holding as a part of the initial portfolio. See, it is like setting up some initial condition. So, you just buy some initial portfolio. And uh, if you observe carefully, so this means that for example, if I look at 42612, this means that these are the number of units of some exchange traded fund on small cap equities that you have invested in. Uh, and also the unit cost, so the unit cost here identifies the transaction cost for each of the asset class. So, remember that for the first three asset class, it was 0 0.1 percent, which when you divide by 100 becomes 0 0.001. And finally, for the emerging equities, you have uh, four times the transaction cost. So, in this case, we have 0 0.004. So, this is the cell array that actually uh, gives you the basic uh, the, you know parameters, namely the price, the holding and the transaction cost. Uh, now, we create a blotter. So, blotter is nothing but uh, literally it means that it is a record of the trade detail. 
So, in the blotter, uh, what we do is that we create a table uh, whose uh, first uh, column are going to be the row names. Uh, the second column, which uh, we identify as blotter dot price, is going to be the price. So, it is going to be this column vector uh, of these four quantities. The third uh, command that you have here, this is the blotter initial holding and this is equal to the holding. So, this is the initial number of units of each asset that you are holding. Uh, so, once you have the price and the holding, so obviously then uh, what is going to be the total wealth. So, this command blotter dot price star dot blotter initial holding, what it does is that it uh, takes the blotter price vector and the blotter initial holding vector, which are price and holdings and multiplies them component wise and adds them up. So, if you do the multiplication manually, you will see that the wealth level turns out to be 7.5 million. And then uh, what you do is that you take the blotter price dot blotter initial holding. So, what it does is that it so this blotter price dot blotter initial holding uh, this basically gives you a vector uh, of, uh, of size 4 uh, whose each, each component will essentially give you the total amount of money that is invested uh, in each of the assets. So, its components will be 52.4 into 42938 and so, so uh, likewise for the other components. So, each of those four components when you divide by the total wealth, you will basically get what is going to be your initial weights for each of those uh, components uh, that you have identified here at the top and blotter unit cost is the transaction cost. Uh, so, what we have done is in the blotter, we have uh, stored basically the price, the holding and the unit cost. Uh, and in addition to that, we have calculated uh, the wealth and the reason we calculated the wealth is so that we can then calculate what is the weights of each of those holdings. Okay, so now, uh, uh, when you are when you are creating like this, so this first uh, term that you have is uh, first component that you have is blotter price. So, this blotter price pr prints here in this column that you have here, this price column. Then blotter initial holding is the second column. Uh, then the initial portfolio, uh, this is going to be uh, given by this. So, this is the blotter initial portfolio which gives the weight. So, you see that the weights are 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.2 and 1 and the unit cost is the last column that shows up. Uh, so, observe carefully in the initial uh, portfolio, we have satisfied the condition that bonds has to be at least 15 percent uh, and the equities can at least, uh, can at most be uh, uh, 85 percent. So, in this case 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 that adds up to 0 0.7. So, it is 70 percent and emerging equities is 10 percent, uh, which is obviously much less than the 35 percent upper cap that is being used. Okay, uh, so, now what you do is that once we have set up all this information at the current time point, this information pertaining to our initial portfolio, what we do is that we now need to simulate the asset prices. So, in order to simulate the asset prices, what you need to do is that we have to make use of the historical data. So, you can uh, make use of the historical data on a spreadsheet and you calculate what is the asset mean that is the expected return for each of the asset class based on you know preceding uh, uh, returns over a certain period of time and this is going to be the asset covariance that you have. Uh, that is the covariance between the different assets classes, which is a 4 by 4 matrix. Now, uh, what you have is that we identify this variable x to be a portfolio simulation. So, x will basically simulate a uh, portfolio using some underlying uh, uh, modeling techniques. Uh, uh, perhaps, you know, it, it will use some index model, geometric Brownian motion and so on. And what it does is that it basically simulates uh, the projection of the future asset prices for each of the categories starting with the uh, uh, current mean and uh, covariance as estimated from the historical return. Uh, so, here uh, this asset mean by 12, what it does is that the asset mean by 12 here essentially gives you the monthly return. So, the values that we have here uh, is, uh, is basically uh, these are the annual uh, returns, the asset mean and asset covariance that you have is the annual return. So, basically you have to uh, look at the past data to see what has been the yearly return. So, and then what you do is that you uh, divide that by 12. So, that is going to give you some sort of an average of the monthly returns and then what you do is that you essentially uh, simulate uh, this and uh, simulate the a projected price using the model parameters of the uh, mean vector and the covariance matrix. 
So, what x does here is that x is going to basically be a portfolio simulation for uh, 60 months that is for 5 years. So, now what you do is that the value of x is the return value. So, you can convert that to the absolute value of the asset prices by using the command ret 2 tick and this is going to be 1 by 12. So, this basically uh, uh, means the following that y is going to be nothing but a conversion of return to the price of the stocks uh, that you have sim simulated and uh, what you do is that uh, and then uh, you, what you are doing is that you are converting x uh, which is the stock price to the return uh, y and uh, these are going to be values that are projected on a monthly basis that is why you have the intervals of 1 by 12. So, accordingly you see we have intervals of 1 by 12. So, you have 60 points that are being simulated and then uh, you plot this t which is 1 by 12 and you take the corresponding value of log y. So, these are basically the simulated values of the asset class uh, of uh, the simulated values being the, the plotted. In fact, uh, what we are plotting here is the log of the simulated prices, uh, but uh, we just have to uh, keep into account that all this was done by setting the uh, initial asset total return prices to be normalized to 1. So, that is the reason why these log values are going to be equal to 0. So, uh, so we start off with uh, uh, so basically this is the simulation of the uh, uh, values of the different asset class after having normalized. So, the next step is to set up a portfolio object. So, once we what we have done is that right now the only piece of information that we have is that we have looked at what is the mean, uh, what is the covariance, what is the initial portfolio parameters and then you have simulated the values. So, now we slowly need to start uh, getting into uh, incorporating the uh, constraints that are specific to me as an individual. So, this constraint you know this advantage of this approach is that you can set up your constraint. Remember that this is just for illustrative purposes and you can set up your constraint as per your choice you know sub, as an individual you might not like the 85 percent constraint on equity and you might prefer only 50 percent. So, all you need to do is in the in the code you have to just change this 85 to 50 percent and emerging equity you might not want more than 10 percent. So, you can set this to be 10 percent instead of 35 percent. So, this inbuilt uh, setup is very very flexible from that point of view that it can accommodate and is amenable to the individual investor specific uh, uh, constraint and preferences. So, just to revisit, so coming back to the specific example under consideration. So, what you do is that you consider the portfolio weights and they, these uh, have to be non-negative. Remember that there is uh, no short selling then no borrowing or leverage that is allowed and of course, the statutory constraints that the sum is going to be equal to 1. And also the three asset classes cannot have more than 85 percent of the total wealth being invested. And uh, finally, the emerging equity there is uh, you cannot have among those each of these equity classes, the emerging equity cannot have more than 35 percent of the portfolios. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, what do you do now is uh, we now create a portfolio object P uh, using the portfolio command. So, in this case we have the name and uh, we have the asset allocation portfolio and the uh, asset list. Uh, so, what we have is that this portfolio command will uh, call the, the name the, the, uh, the asset and it will consider the asset allocation that was made and the asset list and all the other uh, relevant terminologies. So, now here so uh, just there are, there are six things the name the asset allocation portfolio the asset list the assets the initial portfolio and the uh, blotter initial portfolio. So, now what you do is that first of all we set the default constraints on P whatever is there. So, typically in MATLAB you finish typically initiate with a default constraint and then what I need to do is I need to bring. So, what are the default constraints? So, the default constraints are uh, essentially that the sum is equal to 1 and the portfolio weights are non-negative. Now, these two are the default constraints and on top of it what you do is that you now have to incorporate the two individual investor specific constraints of 85 and 35 percent. Uh, so, accordingly you first set the group and you identify uh, 
with 0, 1, 1, 1. So, these are basically identifiers uh, uh, of the each of the individual asset class where the 0 means that the constraint does not have to be allocated to that and 1, 1, 1 means that the constraint has to be allocated for the each of the 3 equity class and that constraint is set to be a maximum of 85 percent. And then we refine this a little more and say that on top of this constraint, I will have another constraint that only for the last asset class, namely the emerging equities, you can the weight can be at most 0 0.35. So, uh, what you do is that now uh, in P, you also incorporate the asset moments. The asset moment is what? It is the asset mean by 12 and asset covariance by 12, which was basically the historical asset mean and covariance on a monthly basis that was something that we had done earlier remember the one with 0 0.5 0 0.1 so this was the uh, uh, here we had the asset mean and the asset covariance so we uh, recapitulate that so now we estimate the asset moments and uh, we uh, incorporate y which was the absolute value of the simulated and then uh, uh, the annual asset mean and covariance uh, you can multiply uh, uh, 12 with asset mean and covariance. So, essentially what the P does is that in this case we are calculating the annual uh, asset mean and asset covariances using the simulated data uh, in order to make your projection. Now, once you have uh, the, the first real uh, non-trivial uh, extension of what you have already done uh, was essentially setting up these two particular constraints that we have here. So, now we need to next check whether these constraints have actually been incorporated. So, accordingly we estimate the bounds on P uh, and uh, the output will be displayed as a lower bound and the upper bound. So, you see that the lower bound and upper bound are in the first and the second column and each of the rows gives us the asset class. So, you observe carefully that um, uh, for the bonds you have to invest at least 15 percent of your wealth. So, the lower bound on the weight is 0 0.15 and of course, you know you are free to invest your entire amount of money in the bond. So, which means the upper bound is 1. Now, for the equity classes I said that the sum of the assets in the equity class can uh, be at most 85 percent and uh, uh, with no short selling allowed. So, that means the minimum that can, you can have for the large and small cap equity class is going to be 85 percent and in case of the uh, uh, in emerging equities, the lower bound is 0 and since you can have at most a 35 percent investment in that. So, the upper bound here is 0 0.35. So, this uh, is just a validation or a check to see that the lower and upper bounds have been captured. Uh, by P in a correct manner. Okay, so, now that we have the basic uh, parameter uh, set up and as well as uh, the constraints that have been brought in into the picture. So, now the next thing is to look at what is the plotting the efficient frontier. So, we construct the portfolio object to uh, create the efficient frontier which is of this particular form. So, typically what is going to happen is that uh, you can uh, uh, the default number of uh, portfolios that are plotted along the efficient frontier uh, is 10, but if you want you can uh, uh, of course, uh, choose a portfolio uh, an efficient frontier which displays a large number of portfolios. So, in this particular case they have said that you plot the frontier. So, plot frontier is going to plot the efficient frontier and this 40 indicates that you have 40 points. And the initial portfolio lies somewhere here and of course, this is going to be the efficient portfolio and if you observe carefully at the lower end of the efficient portfolio, the return is 0 0.06 or that is 6 percent and on the upper end of course, you know you, it goes up to a much higher amount as you can see that this is closer to 13 percent. Okay, now, uh, let us now once we have this efficient portfolio, the next thing that we can look at is we can do the evaluation of the gross versus the net profit returns. So, the portfolio object uh, P that we have defined so far while it includes the transaction, transaction, uh, the, transaction lim uh, the limits on the weights uh, uh, specified uh, the three limits that we had specified in addition to the statutory weight limit of sum being equal to 1. Uh, but however, it does not uh, factor in the transaction cost that we had identified earlier. Remember that we had a transaction cost of 10 basis points and uh, uh, for the first three asset classes and for the last asset class we had a 40 percent uh, a 40 basis point or 0.4 percent. 
so, what you do is that we create another portfolio object where you set costs on P uh, uh, by incorporating the unit cost and we call this as Q. Uh, so, remember that so just to distinguish and uh, to just do a recap. P is the portfolio where transaction costs are not included and Q is going to be the portfolio where the transaction costs are included. So, these are the outputs that you get out of uh, this, uh, uh, this setting up of the transaction costs. So, now uh, let us look at uh, the analyzing the descriptive properties of the portfolio structure. So, what you do is that uh, uh, we now focus more on the ranges of efficient portfolio returns and risk and then we uh, incorporate uh, what is known as the efficient frontier limits to obtain portfolio at the ends of the efficient frontier. So, essentially this estimate frontier limits what it does is that it will give you uh, the extreme uh, points, it will identify the extreme points and by identification of extreme points I here mean that it is going to identify what is going to be the uh, extreme um, uh, return uh, that you get. Uh, uh, for the efficient frontier uh, in case of uh, both P uh, without the transaction cost and Q with the transaction cost. So, accordingly uh, what you do is that we estimate the uh, estimate portfolio moments and uh, what you do is that we P rate and Q rate for P return and Q return. What it does is that it estimates the portfolio return uh, for P and Q uh, for the, the extreme or the endpoints of the efficient frontier graph in case of P and Q respectively. So, in this case what it does is that uh, it is basically going to give you. So, uh, when I display uh, this spread 0, Pratt and Q rate. So, what it does is that it is going to give you uh, the annualized portfolio returns uh, and uh, the first thing it will do is that what is the initial portfolio return that whatever is the initial portfolio that you have started off with what is going to be the return of that and what is going to be the minimum uh, uh, return uh, of the efficient portfolio that is what is going to be on the left hand point of the efficient frontier. So, basically it will identify uh, what is going to be the return here, what is going to be the return here and what is going to be the return here at this particular point. Uh, so, uh, each of those rows correspond to the returns, uh, those returns at the middle and at the uh, bottom end and at the top end. And uh, the returns are of two kinds, one is the gross return that comes from P, uh, P and the other uh, is the net return which comes from Q. So, uh, you observe carefully that the initial portfolio return of course, you know uh, it is going to be identical in terms of the gross at net return which stands at 9.7 percent in this specific example. Uh, in case of the portfolio P, uh, you see that the minimum uh, return that is 5.9 percent and the maximum return is 13.05 percent. So, this if you look at graphically, so this is somewhere where you are 4.5 percent lies and this is where some 13.05 percent lies. So, this this point and this point are the ones which gives us 5.9 percent and 13.05 percent. So, likewise if you draw the efficient frontier for Q, then you get your uh, net profit of 5.77 percent and 12.86 percent. Uh, so, obviously as expected five there this net return uh, for the minimum as well as the maximum efficient. Uh, are going to be less than the gross because obviously some of those uh, returns uh, that you are going to get is going to be eroded in case of NAT because this is what you get after uh, your uh, transaction costs have been incorporated. Okay, so, now that we have set up uh, all these constraints uh, barring one of one constraint uh, regarding the turnover which is something that we will deal with at a later stage. So, now you see that uh, in this case uh, we show that the cost to tr uh, the trade uh, you know has been specified here. Uh, that means, if the cost to trade will basically give the difference between the gross and the net uh, returns. So, now what you do is now we go back and look at uh, what is the basic motivation of efficient frontier. And uh, remember that what was the efficient frontier? The efficient frontier was that for a given level of risk it gives you the highest return or for a given level of return it gives the minimum risk. So, in the next two steps what we will do is that we will look at obtaining a portfolio at a specified return level on the efficient frontier. So, what you do is that what is we identify what is Q return remember that you have to use Q return instead of P return because the transaction cost from the practical point of view the transaction cost has to be accounted for. 
So for at this point we have to work with Q return and then uh, what you do is that uh, now uh, when you say that we are going to obtain a portfolio at a specified level of return. So uh, you can of course specify your level of returns uh, in terms of gross or net. So if we are looking at net return which is what matters you can choose any level of return that you want between 5.77 and 12.86. So this again gives you a flexibility of choice in terms of your investment level. Uh, however, you know it is uh, a common approach to select portfolios. So uh, what I am saying is that some uh, uh, will set this, this to be a 30 percent level uh, of the two ends of the uh, efficient frontier. So if you go back to the efficient frontier, we choose a return level that is 30 percent from this point and 70 percent from the right hand side point. And so accordingly we set the level uh, to be uh, at uh, 30 percent or 0.3. Uh, of so uh, so in order to obtain uh, so the goal is to obtain a portfolio that is a 30 percent of the range from the minimum to the maximum return so uh, you have the q return and what you do is that so you have a q return which will uh, store the efficient frontier limits and then uh, you have to then decide what is going to be the exact portfolio that you want to you get as a result of you deciding that you want to set your expected return level to be 30 percent uh, of the range from the minimum. So accordingly uh, the, this portfolio moments are estimated. So what you do is the following that uh, Q WGT so WGT is for weights. So the weights uh, for the portfolio which satisfies this level of 30 percent that weight will be given by Q uh, W G T and uh, what is going to be the corresponding return and risk. So, the corresponding return and risk associated with that particular portfolio will be stored as Q R S K and Q return. So, it turns out that the weights that you have here that those weights for each of the four asset classes are 0 0.6252, 0 0.1856, 0 0.0695 and 0 0.1198. And for this particular weight being invested in each of the four uh, assets that, that means 0 0.6252 into your total value. Uh, so, that is the weighted sum uh, uh, that you get of uh, into these returns. So, that is going to give you an overall return of 7.90 and a risk of 9.09. So, that means this particular portfolio that is of interest to your 30 percent which will lie somewhere here uh, as indicated by the cursor. So, that is going to give you uh, a return of 7.90 percent and a risk of 9.09. But as I said that again you know uh, this is uh, the nice thing about this inbuilt software that you are setting the level at uh, 30 percent and you are free as an investor to set your level uh, as per your choice. If you want to have the extremely high returns you can set the level to be 1 and then of course you will get the highest possible return which of course comes with the highest level of risk. Uh, so, the summary is that, uh, that the portfolio at 30 percent is basically it is a return of 7.9 percent and a risk of 9.1 percent. Okay, so, the next thing is that uh, you know we have specified the return. So, the next uh, the alternative approach would be to instead of specifying the return level we specify the risk levels or the efficient frontier. Uh, so, uh, suppose that you want to target values of the portfolio risk and uh, you can have different risks. So, uh, you may choose a conservative target risk uh, which is set at 10 percent. Uh, if you are a moderate risk investor or a risk taker that uh, you can set it for 15 percent and uh, if you are a more uh, aggressive risk taker then you can set your target to 20 percent. So, again you know you can choose your uh, risk level uh, and here we are setting the target at all three just for comparative purposes, but of course you can just set your target risk to a single one. Uh, so, again this offers you flexibility. So, here when you set the target risk, so what you do is that once you have set the target risk then you can determine the corresponding weight uh, of estimating the efficient frontier by risk. So, here you observe that this estimate frontier by return means that it is, it is a command that is going to give you the weights of the portfolio for a specified return level and estimate frontier by risk it is going to give you the weights of a portfolio for a specified risk level so, which in this case have been given as 10, 15 and 20 percent. So, once uh, this has been calculated you can display the weights. So, each of those three columns the three columns correspond to 10, 15 and 20 percent. So, accordingly this uh, 
So, these are the weights. So, as you can observe very carefully that uh, if you are uh, risk averse at 10 percent, so obviously, you put uh, a large amount of money uh, in the in the uh, in the bonds that is uh, more than half of your money is in bonds. And then if you switch from 10 to 15 percent uh, of uh, your uh, risk uh, risk tolerance level, then immediately the, uh, the weight comes down from more than 50 percent or uh, more than 0 0.5 to something like 20 percent of your total money is being uh, invested in the in the bond and finally, when you are setting at 20 percent then all you have to do is then the optimized portfolio turns out that you just have to put the minimum 15 percent that you are required by the constraint to put in the bond. So, as you see that as you move from left to right that means, uh, in, in this table that me this means that as you are increasing your risk level you see that your weights uh, for the bonds is gradually decreasing and the weights for the equities you know that they have increased and of particular interest observe that here that in the last case when you are targeting 20 percent risk then the weights are increasing and actually hits uh, the maximum limit of 35 percent in case of the emerging equities. Okay, uh, so, now uh, you can use this command estimate portfolio risk. Uh, for each of those q weights. So, the q w g t is gives, gives you the uh, 3 portfolios at the 3 risk level. So, just as a check to make sure that things are going fine. So, you can calculate what is the risk with this, uh, these different weights and the risk turns out to be 10, 15 and 20 percent as you had said earlier. So, these are some of the checks and balances that uh, has to be accommodated for uh, just to make sure that uh, there is no error that unexpected error that has been creeping in. Okay, so, now that uh, now the next question is, so once you have all these things set up, uh, so what you do is now we have talked about efficient frontier and we have talked about uh, a specified return or a target amount of risk. Uh, so, what you want to do is that you want to shift from the current portfolio to a moderate portfolio. So, this means that we are now bringing into picture the uh, amount of money, uh, the buying and selling of assets. So, that is the reshuffling of portfolio to see, uh, get a better result. So, now you see that uh, suppose that you want to shift. So, what you do is that you set the q weights. Uh, so, you set the efficient frontier by risk and uh, to be q and you set it to be 0 0.15. So, that means your uh, turnover can be 15 percent. Now, you see that uh, a q buy will basically give you the buying that you have to do and q sell is the selling that you have to do. And interestingly, it turns out that if we average the Q buying and Q selling, so that means the total uh, proportion of wealth that is actually uh, being involved in the, in the transaction, uh, turns out that it is going to be 17 percent. So, that means, uh, the amount of money, uh, amount of reshuffling that is happening or the readjustment of the portfolio results in a turnover of 17 percent, which is higher than the permissible limit of 15 percent. So, clearly this is not going to work. So, what you want to do is that now you want to set the uh, portfolio turnover. So, obviously, this uh, command is not working. So, accordingly there is a set turnover in the financial toolbox which will ensure that uh, you, you take the portfolio queue and you basically uh, uh, you set the portfolio queue such that the turnover is restricted to 0 0.15 percent and then you make an estimate of what is going to be the weights of the portfolio. Uh, in terms of uh, after having set the turnover at 15 percent and what is going to be the buy, uh, the buying and the selling strategies uh, that actually uh, ensures that the turnover is rest, uh, restricted to 15 percent. Uh, so, what do you do is that? So, here now uh, we go back to blotter. So, we say that uh, blotter port will basically uh, will assign the q weight that is the weight of the efficient frontier q that is set equal to the blotter uh, port. So, that means, the portfolio now uh, is changed from the original portfolio and the weights assigned to the portfolio now are going to be the weights which takes into uh, consideration that there is a 15 percent cap on the turnover and the blotter buy and blotter sell will basically give you uh, the number of units that you have to buy or sell. So, now once you display the blotter, so remember that the original blotter only had up to the unit cost. 
So, remember that we had the original blotter table earlier which had bonds, large, small and emerging equities. So, we had the price, the initial holding, the initial portfolio was 30, 40, 20 and 10 percent and the unit cost was this. Now, what has happened is that now uh, this uh, blotter port what it does is that it now prints this portfolio. So, now the portfolio has changed from 0 point uh, this structure. So, uh, uh, in the initial portfolio, the new portfolio now has the weights as given in this column. So, for example, for bonds, the initial portfolio had the weight of bonds at as 0 0.3 and this is now uh, changed to 0 0.18787. Similarly, the other ones have also changed. Uh, so, for example, large cap equities there is no change it remains as 0 0.4, small cap changes from 0 0.2 to 0 0.16213 and the emerging equities have changed from 0 0.1 to 0 0.25. Uh, so, if you observe carefully that uh, if you look at the initial portfolio and you look at the new portfolio, so this means that there is a reduction in the weight. So, this means that there is no buying, but there is only selling. Uh, in case of large cap equities, the weight remains unchanged at 0 0.4. So, the, there is no buying or selling at all. Uh, in case of uh, the small cap equities, you move from 0 0.2 to 0 0.16213. So, that means there is no buying because there is a reduction and instead there is selling uh, and in case of emerging equities you have moved from 0 0.1 to 0 0.25. So, that means uh, 0 0.25 minus 1. So, there is a change in the weight. So, that means that you have to buy and there is no selling. So, basically as you move from this initial portfolio to a portfolio at your desired uh, level that you have. So, that, that uh, at a set turnover of 15 percent. Uh, it turns out that it will involve the buying uh, in case of bonds and small cap equities and it involves no change in the status of the uh, uh, buying in case of the uh, bonds and small cap equities and no change in the status of uh, large cap equities and there is a significant amount of buying involved in emerging equities. So, everything that you get by selling off uh, bonds and small cap equities is then reinvested in emerging equities. Now, you have to take into account that uh, you know this buying and selling uh, will involve transaction cost. So, accordingly what you have to do is that uh, you have to take the blotter into unit cost. So, what you do is that uh, you take the blotter into unit cost. So, what is the blotter into unit cost? This was basically the entries in the unit cost column and you multiply this by uh, blotter buying and selling. Remember that uh, there is a cost involved for both buying and selling. And uh, that per this buying and selling that you have here, the these are uh, added and component wise they are multiplied to the unit cost and this you multiply by your total wealth. So, what is this going to give you? It is going to give you that uh, it is the total wealth multiplied by the sum of the total cost. So, this is going to be give you the total cost uh, from the transaction that has happened that is the total transaction cost. So, this turns out to be 5.6248 uh, into 10 raised to 3 that is 5625 dollars, uh, but one does not need to worry about that because you remember that you had kept. Uh, sufficient cash namely 60,000 dollars initially. So, this is 60,000 uh, dollars in addition to the 7.5 million that we had initially set up. So, this uh, sufficient cash holding of 60,000 uh, dollars is more than enough to cover for this transaction cost because you see the transaction cost is 5625 which is obviously much much less than the 60,000 uh, which is the maximum amount of cash that is available you to you for the transaction cost. So, thus uh, you know you are able to have this uh, gig, it is because of this amount of money that you are actually able uh, to populate your blotter uh, with the new portfolio holdings. Now, that means, uh, you are actually able to do this transaction to get a better portfolio because you had this money uh, set aside. Okay, uh, so, now uh, what you do is that now we can uh, compute the number of shares to buy or sell on your blotter. So, so, what we have done here is in terms of buy and sell, uh, what we have identified here is nothing but uh, uh, the, the weights. So, uh, the weights is not enough for a practical point of view of course, you do not do the transaction in weights, but what you do is that you uh, talk about the transactions in terms of the number of assets that you buy. So, what you do is that the blotter holding is given by uh, the blotter portfolio. So, the blotter port, port is this column. Uh, which is the new portfolio 
uh, divided by the blotter price into the wealth. So, basically you, uh, you find out what is going to be the bl blotter holding and uh, the blotter buy share. So, this is going to give you the shares that you have to number of shares that you have to buy and the blotter sell share it will give you the number of uh, shares that you have to sell. So, once this strategy of buying and selling is specified in terms of number of weights uh, what this blotter buy share and blotter sell share does is essentially it gives you the exact units of the number of shares that you need to buy or sell in order to achieve your portfolio. And so accordingly now that uh, you, you now have uh, a new component to the blotter in terms of buying and selling and uh, selling that comes into the picture. So now the blotter is a 4 by 7 table where of course you know you have this uh, price initial holding initial portfolio that was there. This is your new portfolio which you have calculated. So this has to be your new holding now. So the new holding now is given by this particular column. And so, the new holding, so you now you compare the initial holding with the new holding. So, that means the number of units of the bonds that you had which is 42938 now reduces to 26889. And so, this means that there is a reduction in the share. So, if you look very carefully that this 42938 minus 26889, the difference between these two ends up being the amount number of units of shares that you have to sell. Of course, there is no buying. Uh, as before the large cap equities there is no change in the number of units uh, and uh, in, in the third case you know that this is the number of shares that you have sell this is a truncation error that is why a point 0.8 comes and of course uh, in the fourth case uh, you have a significant increase from 15991 to 39977 resulting from uh, buying of 23986 number of shares. So, basically the sale from these two shares uh, gives you an income and then uh, this is an expenditure that results from buying this large number of shares in emerging equities. Uh, okay, so, the final plot that you have here uh, is remember that uh, this is the final plot holder. So, this is the if, uh, plot of the efficient frontier. So, we are reaching the closing stages of this uh, discussion. So, the plot uh, display the efficient frontier uh, with uh, 40. So, what it does is that this final plot uh, what it does is that it uses the plot frontier function. Uh, so, it is used to now we plot the efficient frontier and uh, we have the initial portfolio which plots it plots the initial portfolio uh, and also it plots the fully specified portfolio optimization problem. So, this is the efficient frontier after all your constraints uh, such as that uh, all your constraints such as the transaction cost and the turnover rate these have been fully specified along with your specified level of return and risk and so for a fully specified optimization problem and uh, so what it does is that it gives you the uh, optimization the efficient frontier the green one is the initial portfolio and the red one is the final portfolio so the, this is now uh, this, uh, this is now that we have displayed the final results uh, and so you can you can have some uh, local functions that are specified uh, such as this function of display returns and function of display return levels. So, uh, essentially you know this entire code is enough for you to actually create your own portfolio except that right at the beginning you have to separately uh, calculate uh, your uh, using historical data you have to calculate the asset mean and asset covariance and you have to input it here. But after that the remaining uh, work is actually taken care of by the uh, financial uh, toolbox. So, uh, this concludes uh, this lecture. So, in this lecture just to give a recap of whatever we have done, we started off with a simple example of asset allocation for which we chose to invest in both uh, equities and risk free assets namely bond and within equities we uh, considered uh, a variety of classes namely uh, large cap, small cap and emerging equities. And uh, what we did first was that we look at the historical data and we input the uh, parameters that are required in the mean variance framework namely the expected return and the covariance matrix and this was simulated and then uh, uh, to obtain the efficient frontier. Now, we started off with an efficient uh, with a particular portfolio of our choice and then we looked at an improvement over this portfolio to obtain a specific portfolio tailored to the interest uh, or the requirements of an individual investor. So, several constraints were brought into the picture. So, to begin with we had the constraints on the weights being equal to some of the weights being equal to 1 
and also we had the constraint that there was no negative weights that means there was no shortening involved for equities and there was no borrowing or leverage uh, in case of uh, in case of bonds and uh, we then uh, moved ahead and uh, we set up a couple of other constraints so one of the constraint was that we put a minimum uh, level uh, minimum amount of weight that has to be assigned uh, to the bonds uh, which consequently meant that there was an upper cap on the equities and within the equity structure we had an upper cap on the highest risk group among those equities namely the emerging equities and uh, then uh, we talked about setting up a portfolio which uh, was as a design to uh, accommodate a specific return level that an investor might prefer and then uh, the other uh, aspect of it was to include a specific risk level uh, as given by the uh, investor and uh, so once this was done we had to also take into account the other factors such as transaction cost and the transaction cost uh, were specified uh, in terms of basis points uh, with uh, higher basis points being applicable in case of uh, the emerging equities and then finally we had to bring into picture uh, the constraint of turnover which means that we put a upper cap on the uh, proportion of transaction or the extent to which you can do the transactions and once all of this was set up we had the efficient frontier and the optimized portfolio which gave us that uh, gave us what was the initial portfolio and what was the holdings that means what was the specific number of units of each of those classes and after optimization having incorporated all the constraints as well as individual investor requirements we are able to get a new modified portfolio and, and the necessary transactions uh, in terms of buying or selling of the individual assets that is necessary in order to attain this uh, modified or a desired portfolio. See this concludes uh, the lecture for today and in the next lecture we will continue our discussion on the usage of MATLAB uh, 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 and in particular uh, on the usage of the financial toolbox into other aspects of the portfolio optimization problem. Thank you for watching.